Um, we're going to look at the Word of God together. Um, so if you have a Bible with you, um, turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 from verse 11. Quite a chunk of scripture that we're going to read together um, this morning. So if you have got a Bible or an app, um, it would be well worth following along. Revelation 20 from verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead and the, the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. And those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. He's talking about the church. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And it shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel. Like a jasper clear as crystal, it had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And there were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And we'll just skip some measurements there, and we'll pick it up in verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it and nothing impure will ever enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. 
Amen? What an incredible promise. What an incredible future. What a glorious destiny. So much symbolic language and metaphor here. And yet a very clear promise of a day that is coming when the old order of things will have passed away and everything will be new. No more mourning or crying or pain. Every tear wiped from every eye. No injustice. No suffering. No oppression. No rape. No crime. No abuse. No slavery. No poverty. No lack. No hurting. Everything made new. The old order of things has passed away. I am making everything new. The old order of things is broken. Like I preached the other week, if you were here, we need to realize that there is a problem in our world and that it is serious. We don't live in a basically great world where everything's more or less right and You only have to watch the news as we sat there, you know, even this morning talking about coming together and praying for schoolgirls who have been kidnapped. We don't have to look far. And even in our own situations, our own circumstances, we're aware of people in our families, our friends, our contacts who are suffering. There is a problem in our world. It is a broken world. It is a hurting world. It is a damaged world. And the problem with our world is sin. It's not that we're trying to attribute the suffering of people to their own individual sins, but we realize that the Bible teaches us that all that is broken in our world is a consequence of humanity's decision to live life our own way, to do things our own way, to live apart from a relationship with God. That all that is damaged, all that is broken, all that hurts in our world is rooted in that decision that we made at the beginning but that every one of us has made ever since. Consciously or otherwise, I'll live my life my way. I'll live outside of a relationship with God. I'll live life on my terms. And there are consequences of those decisions and our world became broken and damaged and it got worse and it got worse. Have you ever taken something back to a shop because it was faulty, because it was broken? Or maybe you made a claim on a warranty. Sometimes you take it back, you, you, you phone up the, the, the warranty line and they say they'll repair it for you. And you're a bit disappointed really because you get it back and it's never quite the same. You know that something's still not right. It's not the way it was supposed to be. Often what you're really hoping for is that they will give you a new one. I once had a a mobile phone and it stopped working and I couldn't get it sorted out and I phoned them up and was doing all these strange things and eventually they agreed and they said that they would have to give me, a. well initially I had to post it away and and then they phoned after a couple of days and they said, oh we're going to have to give you a new one and I was disappointed at first because you know, with mobile phones, it means like you've got to enter all your data in again and you've got to set it all up. I mean, it's just like you get a new phone. Judith knows if I get a new phone, that's it. I'm gone for the next two days, um, just like trying to work it all out. And so I was frustrated. But then they said, we're really sorry, but we don't have that model anymore. We're going to have to give you a better model of phone. And suddenly I wasn't so disappointed anymore. God's plan is not a repaired creation with a few broken bits that have been stuck back on with gaffer tape. Or we'll give it a a new lick of paint, we'll stick a few things back on and nobody will notice. God says, I am making everything new. 
The old order of things has passed away and I am making everything new. That's God's plan. That's what God is doing in our world. It's called new creation. New creation, not just a, you know, a patched up version, a slightly improved version of what we already know, but a new and better model, the way it was always supposed to be. And you know that even includes us. That even includes you and me. God promises us that in Jesus, through his death and resurrection, we can be made completely new. Not just the slightly patched up version of me. Not just the you know the the you that you know we stuck a few bits back on and you know. He'll help you maybe not to swear quite as much as you used to, and and he'll he'll change a few things here and there, and that'll do, that'll pass. No, the plan of God is not a slightly improved you, but a totally transformed and brand new you. And utterly, totally you the way you were always supposed to be. A new you as part of a new heavens and a new earth, a new creation. That's our destiny. The old order of things has passed away. And see, I am making everything new. So what we enter into when we become new is just the beginning of an amazing transformation. And so he makes us new even physically. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. From verse 35. 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? Of what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed. Perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he is determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. And stars differ from stars. In their splendor. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the, imperish- nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash... In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. For the imperishable must clothe itself with the imp- the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true: death has been swallowed up in victory. 
Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You see, when Jesus comes again, And the dead in Christ are raised and we all appear before God. The physical will catch up with what has begun for us in the spiritual. So we've read in that passage, it began with the physical, with the natural. But of course, we know that because of the choices we made, it all went wrong. And sin and death entered into our world. And God, his desire, his plan, and his purpose is utter and complete transformation, a new creation, something totally new. And so what happens is we have the opportunity to enter into that spiritually now, here on the earth, and a day is coming when we will, so what began naturally, but then we had to begin a new life spiritually, and then the the fullness of that new life is yet to come. Does that make sense? Jesus offers us the opportunity to enter into something far greater than anything we've seen so far in this world. There is a far greater reality, a total transformation. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never given your life to him, if you don't know what it is to have a relationship with him, you need to know this truth. God loves you so much. He made you for a relationship with himself. He made you to be part of his new creation. But as we've said, as a result of our choices to live life apart from God, we are lost without him. But if you will put your hope and your trust in him, if you will ask him to forgive you for living life apart from him and trust him with your life and with your future, he will write your name today in that book of life that we read about. And you never ever have to be separated from him, but rather you can enter into the eternal destiny and reality that we've been speaking about. A new creation. You can be part of new heavens and the new earth where everything is perfect, where every tear is wiped away from every eye. Where there is no more mourning or crying or pain, where there's no injustice. There is no crime. There is no poverty. There is no lack. You can be part of that eternal reality. And you can reign forever with Jesus by placing your life in his hands. So we just pause for a moment right now just to give people that opportunity. If there's anyone here that you want to do that, just right now in your own heart, you can say, God, I am so sorry for living my life my own way apart from you. I may not understand all of this, But something's going on inside of me right now and I believe it to be true that you came and you died and you rose again so that I could be forgiven for living life apart from you, so that I could get a new life with you and be part of this eternity that we've been speaking about. Just ask him right now. And if you've done that in that moment, then we would love to help you. If you came with someone who's happy to talk with you and explain more to you, then great, talk to them. But if they're not confident in doing that, or if you just want to come, maybe you came on your own, you want to come down the front at the end, come and tell us. We would love to help you. There's so much that we'd love to explain to you. Come and tell us that you've made that decision at the end. Those of us who have been born again by the Spirit of God to become new creations spiritually will receive our resurrection bodies when Jesus comes again so that we can be part of the new creation physically. Did you hear that? Those of us who give our lives to Jesus, when we do what we've just created an opportunity to do, the Bible teaches us we get born again. We become a new creation. As 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. We've begun again. But there's something so much more. Because Jesus isn't just patching up 
Life as it always has been. It's not like the same old life carries on. It's just, you know, like we said before, it's just a little bit less swearing or a little, you know, a little bit less selfishness and we try a bit harder to to do good to other people. No, it's not a patching up of the old life. It's the beginning of something far greater, far more awesome, far more glorious. We've seen something beyond this world. Because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is from above. It's from another place. It's so much better. Do you know, it makes no sense at all when we attach so much importance to the things of this world. When we focus so much of our attention on gaining possessions or making ourselves more comfortable As if this present situation is ultimately what matters. Because we were born again for something far greater. For something eternal. For something far more valuable. But we so easily lose sight of that, don't we? And we think it's about the here and now. You see, God's kingdom breaks into the here and now. And shows us something amazing, something glorious that is far more than we've experienced in the here and now. And when that happens, it calls us, it beckons us, it draws us into the fullness of God's plan and purpose. But his plan is not just to make things a bit better, to make us a little bit more comfortable. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19, Paul said this, If only for this life we hope. In Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. If Jesus' death and resurrection was only about this life, if it was only about giving you a little bit more cash and a slightly better job and a slightly bigger house to live in, if that's all it's about, then we are of all people to be most pitied. It has to be more than that. There's something so much more glorious. Let's think about this for a minute. Let's think about healing. Jesus healed the sick, didn't he? In fact, all the people that Jesus prayed for were healed. Whenever Jesus prayed for the sick, they were healed. And Jesus sends us into this world to do the same thing, to heal the sick. But let's stick with Jesus for a moment. Every single sick person that Jesus prayed for recovered. But every single one of them has died since. If it was only for this life that Jesus came, then all the healing miracles that he performed were simply putting off the inevitable. But actually, Jesus was doing something far greater. It's not that Jesus didn't care about the pain and the suffering in the moment he did. We're told that Jesus wept when Lazarus died. We're told again and again that Jesus looked and he had compassion. Jesus cares more than anyone about our pain and our suffering. But there's something far greater that is going on at the same time. As much as he cares about the pain and the suffering and he's with us in the moment, there's also something bigger. Jesus was pointing towards a better kingdom that does not originate in this world, but that comes down and breaks into our world from heaven. Jesus was demonstrating and proving a greater reality, that there is a triumph and a victory over sin and sickness and death. That the old order of things is passing away and that he is making everything new. You see, that's what Jesus did. He arrived into our world and he said, here I am. The time has come. Repent and believe the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. God's rule and reign is breaking into our world. We haven't seen all of it yet, but you can enter into it now. 
And so every time a sick person is healed, every time you meet the needs of people around you, every time you reach out to those who are lonely and marginalized, when you set the oppressed free, when blind eyes are open, every time we see God at work in his kingdom coming, it's an announcement, it's a proclamation. God's rule is breaking into our world. The old order of things is passing away and he is making everything new. There's a greater reality still to come. There's a greater day still to come when everything, when the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. When everything will have been made perfect. But between now and then, heaven is breaking into our world and we are pointing people towards a greater reality. Jesus was pointing to a kingdom that revolves around the glory and the majesty and the splendor And the wonder and the awesome power and the tender compassion and the infinite love of God. He was saying that this is something that is available to you. Heaven's glory, heaven's splendor, the tender compassion and infinite love of God. It's all available to you. You can be part of this reality. You can be part of this eternity. You can enter into it. And you can enter into it now. And you can be born again spiritually now. But know this. What you experience now is but the beginnings. Because the the, the end goal is not just to make you slightly more comfortable in life. It's a wonderful, beautiful, glorious eternity. And by entering into that now, and by being transformed yourself, you can be part of offering that hope to others. Because your life becomes part of the proof that heaven is breaking into our world. Because your life, in yourself, in your character, in what God is doing in you, in how he's transforming and changing you, and in how you are interacting with the world around you, your friends, your neighbours, your colleagues, your life is screaming out all the time, heaven is breaking into our world. Change is possible. The old order of things is passing away. And God is making everything new. And when we think about it like that, none of us would dare to say, look at my life, it's the finished article. But we would say, maybe there's just a glimmer. Maybe there's just something that shines through that points you towards something so much better that is coming more and more into our world and is available to you. Because we are those who have tasted of the powers of the age to come. Whatever we do to witness to the goodness of God and the truth of his love, We're not just doing it to make things a little bit better in the here and now. If we feed the hungry, if we provide shelter for the homeless, whatever we do in our society to see transformation, to make it a better place, if all we're doing is just making things a little bit better in the here and now, we've lost sight of what God has called us to. Every time we relieve suffering, every time we stand alongside people in their pain, that is precious in the sight of God. It is valuable in and of itself. It's a demonstration of his love and his compassion, the truth of his gospel. It matters that we are alongside the hurting, the broken in our society. But there's a greater message. It's a prophetic gesture. It's a sign. It's a proof of heaven's rule breaking into our world. Because a slightly better lot in life is not all that there is to be hoped for. It's not all that there is to be hoped for. There is a hope that will cause the greatest sufferings in your life, in the lives of people around you, the tragic events that we see on our television screens, the things that cause us such pain and anguish in our hearts. There is a greater hope that will cause all of those things to seem in comparison like light and momentary troubles. I do believe that sometimes we are in danger as Christians, particularly here in the West, of living as if this world is all that there is. We lose sight 
of that eternal reality, and we become so focused on our material needs, our physical needs in the world, in the here and now. We end up living for the things of this world. And yet Jesus warned us repeatedly against that. It is true that God loves to bless his people in this world as well as the next. But the blessing of God, the realities of heaven that we receive in the here and now, they are all calling us, drawing us, crying out to us. See, a different kingdom is breaking into this world. The old order of things is passing away and he is making everything new. And so Paul urges us in Colossians 3 verses 2 to 4, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Don't be running around after earthly things. Don't be consumed with the things of this world. Set your minds on things above. That's the hope that you have to offer the world around you. Let heaven flood your heart and mind. Let that wonderful, glorious destiny captivate your heart. Be excited about an eternity of ruling and reigning with Jesus where everything is perfect and there's no crime or injustice, where the old order of things has passed away. Let heaven fill your mind. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let's not fall into the trap of thinking that this world is all that there is for us. Or trying to use our faith merely to make this world a little bit more bearable. God is not just patching up this world. He is making all things new. And when the old order of things has fully passed away, And you know, when people die, it reminds us that the end is still to come. Because scripture tells us the last enemy to be destroyed is death itself. And so when we lose someone, we're reminded the end is still to come. And yet we remember our sure and certain hope of a far greater reality, that death itself will be swallowed up in victory and we will join in that great song. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? And then Christ himself will fill all things. Everything in heaven and on earth will be summed up together in Jesus Christ. All of his glory and majesty and splendor and compassion and grace and mercy and goodness and kindness. All that is magnificent and marvelous and exhilarating and exciting and awesome about Jesus will fill the whole earth. And he will reign for eternity. And he will hand all the glory to his father. And we will be together with him. And we will reign with him forever and ever. This is our hope. This is our hope. This is our destiny. This is what we have to offer the world around us. This is what your friends and mine, your colleagues, your neighbors, my neighbors, this is what they need to know. There is something far greater and they can be a part of it. This is our hope, this is our destiny, and this is the gospel that we proclaim. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you.